praise and glory in this house, God. Lord, not only the songs that we sing, God, but the attitude of our heart today. Lord, may it proclaim the goodness of our God. Lord, you are good and worthy to be praised, Lord. Every one of us this morning, Lord, our lives are filled with testimonies of your goodness, God. Even on our bad days, God, even through the storms of life, God, we must testify how faithful our God has been. Lord, you've kept us, Lord. You've not only died to save us of our sins, God, but you've watched over us every day of our life, Lord. From times, God, that we should not have made it through, Lord, to the seasons of life, God, the valleys, Lord, the low times as well as the high, Lord, you have been faithful, God. And today, Lord, as we come today, we've come to give you glory and honor, Lord. Praise unto you, our King. Lord, as your servant, I humbly acknowledge and testify publicly I'm nothing. As I stand before you this day in this congregation, Lord, I present myself simply as a tool in your hand. Use me as such, however you see fit today, for your glory. Let it be your word that goes forth today, not the word of a man. And I pray that you and you alone are seen and glorified in this house today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord one more praise about this morning. Mind you, we are in our season of prayer and fasting, praying uh, for souls leading up to Resurrection Sunday. I want to encourage you, if, if you've not ever fasted before, prayerfully consider uh, spending some time with the Lord in prayer and fasting uh, over the upcoming weeks. Again, praying that God would speak to the lives of those that we love who are lost, whether they're friends relatives, whatever it may be, that God would shake them and lead them to salvation. I do want to share just a few testimonies this morning as, as uh, every week uh, I want to share with you the things that God's doing just since, our, uh, since last week, since the prayer and fasting began. In this envelope, again, the prayer request that you wrote down and petitioned the Lord for, but share those with me each week. Whether you call the church office, email, text message, message me on social media, however, it doesn't matter. But I want to be able to share what good things God is doing. But there's a few I want to share with you this morning. Uh, on the day before we had begun, so last Monday, Sunday, the, the slips of paper, the prayer requests were made known to God. And there was a very specific prayer request, a family member in the church. Had an accident, and we're getting some physical therapy. The physical therapy days were running out, and they weren't really getting better. Um, they were worried how they were going to pay. They needed more physical therapy, but um, one of those insurance deals. Well, Sunday we prayed at the altar, put these things in the envelope. Monday morning, they got a phone call from uh, the insurance company stating that they were extending their physical therapy days. It wasn't going to be an out-of-pocket expense to them. And they were also bragging about how their progression is. So even though they didn't feel like they were progressing well, they were to God be the glory. God made a way for them to continue. Amen. There's an individual in the church that was sharing with me about a financial blessing. He said, Pastor, you know, we had um, a, a source of income coming in every month um, that we were receiving. And then that came to an end and said, but somebody came up to them uh, Last week, put a check in their hands, and they said, I can't take this. And, yep, God told me to, to give you this. And not only am I giving you this today, but every month I'm going to give you a, a check for this amount. They said, Pastor, they had no idea, you know, about, you know, this income source drying up. They were on a fixed income. It said, guess how much it was, exactly the amount that they were getting from their other source. And God supplied that need. So that's pretty awesome. So not just a one-time blessing, but a, a monthly thing that God had just laid on the heart of somebody else to bless them every month. Um, another individual whose job was coming to an end, and before, um, you know, really even they got to apply for any other place, a job was offered to them, and they can start as soon as their other job is, is finished. And so we give God praise for that. Uh, another individual that was praying for a very specific job opportunity um, God opened up the door for them. They were awarded an externship uh, this, this last week. In other words, they'll get to kind of shadow for a little bit and believe in God that God's going to open that door the rest of the way and bless them with a job opportunity. And one more that I want to share with you this morning before I get into the Word. 
Got a text message just this morning. It said, Pastor, I'm going to give God praise. I've been praying for my job situation. I uh, wanted to be, you know, it pulls me away from home too much. I get home too late, stress, and just trying to figure out direction on, on what God wants me to do. He said, well, I got good news. He said, God blessed me with a major promotion at work uh, earlier this week, and now I'll get off at 5 o'clock every day, be able to get home, be with my family, and get a pay raise, and be able to be more involved and active at church. Amen. Can we give the Lord a praise clap? I love when God does things like that. You know, it's not something you're expecting. You're just trying to figure out, should I stay here? Should I find another job? You know, or how God blessed that, that family with, you know, an income coming in every month that nobody even knows about, and they were going to be all right, you know, and get by even without it. But God knew that they needed it. And so it's just amazing to me how awesome our God is. Amen. Let's give the Lord one more praise clap this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. I want to continue our series on now what, uh, and Lord willing, this will be the, the last in the series, now what. I preached a message back in January, uh, and, and this is what birthed this series. That the message was then what. When you take your last breath here, then what. And again, for the church folks, I, I believe that our then what is, well, I want to be in heaven. That's what, after I take my last breath, I hope to be in heaven. Our, our scripture for this year and what I feel the Holy Spirit impressing on me as a pastor to lead our church to be more intentionally heavenly minded. Our scripture for this year is set your eyes on things above, not on earthly things or things below. There's so many things that we spend our life, quite frankly, wasting our life, chasing and pursuing things that really won't matter a hundred years from now. So pastor, I'll be dead. Exactly. And they won't matter. A lot of things that we, we spend our whole life doing, chasing, pursuing today, won't matter in that short amount of time, but they will matter in eternity. A lot of things that we set our mind to and, and our attention to on this side of glory won't even matter 20 years from now. But what you're investing your time and, and your talents in today, they will matter eternally, whether that's positive or negative. So if, if we're truly setting our eyes on heaven and our then what is heaven, when I, when I leave this place, then I want to be in heaven, then it begs the question now, what, what should I be doing now? How should I be living my life now if I expect to get to heaven? The Word of God is clear. Not everyone who says to me, Jesus said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will end the kingdom of heaven. And we need to, we, we need to give that serious consideration as a church because he's, he's not talking to the lost. He's telling believers, I want you to know, not, not everybody that comes to church and plays the religion game is going to go to heaven. But he who has a relationship with Jesus Christ. So how ought we to be living today? And today's message is making a difference. I want to talk to you about making a difference. I had planned to preach this a, a totally different way, had a different sermon prepared and everything. The Holy Spirit spoke to me this morning and, and brought me to a different passage and gave me an entirely different message, the same title, Making a Difference. So God brought me to this in Matthew 5. But before I get there, I want to ask you a question. How many of you today want to make a difference with your life? Amen. Eternally, I, I want to make a difference. Pat. I, I believe that every one of us, there's something in us. We, we have a desire. I want to make a difference. Life is too short, and, and, and I want my life to count for something. We, we search for meaning because we believe that there's something we're supposed to do. And that's not just a Christian thing. I, I think the lost world around us is clamoring for the meaning of life and because they want their life to count. But I want to talk to you is, is how to make your life count for eternity, how to make a difference eternally. I want you to think for a moment. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to think for a moment. Do you feel like you are making a difference currently, eternally? Just ponder on that thought for a moment. Because we say, you know, I want to make a difference. I want, I want to make a difference with my life. Do you feel like you're doing it? I realize that many of us feel too insignificant to really make a difference. I believe that's one of the lies from hell. I, I believe that 
the devil wants you to feel like you are so small and so insignificant that you really can't make a difference. So the idea of making a difference really is not something that you should pursue, but that's a lie. I believe that every day God gives us opportunities to make a difference eternally. Not only in our own life, but people around us. Every day of our life, God gives us opportunities, plural, to make a difference. And so the question really is, are you willing to make a difference? You want to make a difference? God says, I've given you opportunities every single day. Open your eyes. Are you willing to make a difference? So let's turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Matthew 5 and verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven." You, you are the salt of the earth. You, I want to emphasize that you, not, not y'all, not the crowd, you. This is God. This is the words of Jesus Christ speaking to his followers. He said, you, I'm not talking to everybody this morning. The Holy Spirit's talking to you. You, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light in this world. You, the words of Jesus Christ, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, how can it be salted? It is good for nothing at that point but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Salt. You and I see salt as something very common. I, I, I brought this salt shaker in. You know, we, 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 we think, you know, salt is pretty common. It's not a big deal that I'm salt. But if you understood how significant salt was in biblical days, it... it it was sometimes used as currency. It was used during seasons in history to, to pay people. Soldiers received the word salary. Anybody ever heard that word? Yeah, I know salary. We, we get that word from the word salarium. Anybody? Salary is derived from that. You ever heard the term they're worth their salt? They're worth their paycheck at the end of the week. They, they received the wage, their salary, their salt. It, it, was, it was very valuable because in those days they didn't have freezers and refrigerators. It was good for, for curing and preserving meat. It was good, obviously, for seasoning. It was good to make things thirsty. I, I, I've listened to a lot of Christians talk about, you know, I, I can't push religion down their throat. I feel like I'm pushing them away. You don't have to preach to everybody, but if you make them thirsty enough they'll want to drink I, i've heard the expression you can lead a, wash, a horse to water but you can't make him drink no nope. but if you make him thirsty you give him enough salt he'll want some of that water when he gets there and so you and i listen what does that look like for you you are the salt of the earth if you'll just let jesus christ live in and through you you'll be amazed other people will see and they will want what you have i i want what i see in you even if i don't understand what it is the truth is, this works both ways. You listen to me this morning, church. You are making a difference currently, whether you realize that or not. Now, is it a good difference? I don't know. The father who, who mistreats his wife and doesn't love his wife, you're making a difference to your children today. Don't be surprised when they grow up and they don't know how to love their wife and, and they have trouble in their home because that's what you've shown them. Dad, you, you're drinking in front of Junior and you, you think it's all right. I, and, I, and I've said this before. Listen, you might be able to handle this, but your child might not. What a shame, what a tragic thing that you've set a trap in your own house for your child to stumble into one day just because you're big enough to handle it. I could put a bear trap in the backyard, and as long as I know where it is, I won't step in it. But I wouldn't put one in my backyard because I know that my children might accidentally stumble into it, and I'm not willing to take that chance. Just because you can handle something. Listen, how many children, the first drop of alcohol they taste came from their own home? How many alcoholics today, the first drop that they tasted came from their own cabinet, their own refrigerator. Mom, Dad set a trap, and Junior just happened to fall into it. Well, I didn't realize I was setting a trap. Well, I'm telling you this morning, you are. You are the salt. 
See, you, you are making a difference right now, whether it's good or bad. If you're abusive to your children, you're making a difference. Don't be surprised if they grow up and they don't understand anything but abuse and hate. Don't be surprised if they grow up and they're angry at life and angry at you. You're making a difference. Now, you step back. You you are the salt. If if the salt loses its ability to, to change and influence the atmosphere around it, it's good for nothing. You are the salt of the earth. You are to be a representative and an ambassador of Christ everywhere you go. And so that same difference that you can make negatively, you can make much more powerfully in a positive way. You you don't have to preach to people. You just live. And they'll be saying, I want what you have. You ever been around people that are just negative all the time? Complaining. See, you you make a difference. See, I've realized when, when people die, they'll be remembered for a lot of things. But... Often not the things, you're not going to be remembered for your car or your house. They might talk about those things, but that's not what you're going to be remembered by. That's the mean old guy that lived down the road, isn't it? Yeah, that's him. Man, he was negative. I hated everybody. She was a gossip. That's that's the stuff they'll remember you. On the flip side, I mean, because you're making a difference today. They were the sweetest person I think I've ever met. They had the most generous spirit. I don't think I've ever in my life known anybody as generous as he was or she was. Most loving, genuine, whatever it is, friendly. Man, they always had a smile on their face. You're making a difference today. You don't even realize it. But what I'm talking about is an eternal difference. When we stand before God, the house, the cars, the stuff, none of that's going to matter. Your career, your business card, it won't impress God. Your bank account certainly won't. We've got, you know, more than a handful of billionaires across the globe. And I assure you, every one of them will stand as a poor, poor beggar before God. You think you've got something. That's, that's all you get. The streets are paved with gold. I've heard this little joke before. I thought this guy wanted to carry his gold into heaven, so God let him. Comes on in and says, man, what does he want with all that? Pavement. Streets are paved with gold. It's like toting asphalt around in your pockets thinking you got something. Look at what I got. I, look at all this I got. You got a pothole? What you, what you going to do with all that stuff? And we, we do the same with our wealth on this side of the glory. We run around through life thinking we got something. And I promise you it won't buy you one more breath of life. You let that doctor look at you and say, I'm sorry, sir, there's nothing else we can do. You, you, you write... That check, you pull the checkbook out. Pull your MasterCard out because they've tried to convince people that for everything else there's MasterCard. Pull your MasterCard out then tell that, well, I got a MasterCard. He said, I'm sorry, sir. There's nothing else we can do. You don't understand. Your car, your stuff, it's not going to buy you another breath of life. Then what? I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference eternally. You are the salt. You are are the light. You, you. Everywhere you go, you ought to influence the people around you. You ought to influence life around you. One thing that I've learned over time is that you and I aren't called to change the world. We're called to change the world around us. If we change the world around us, the world will be changed. When Jesus called the 12 disciples, he, he had intended to change the world, but he didn't send any of them to America. You know that? But America will be changed because all I've called you to do is change the world around you. If you'll change the world around you, then together we'll change the world. You you are the salt right where you are. When I put this salt in, it's not a matter of me salting the whole world. I just need to salt my own soup. You feel like you're insignificant. You feel like, you know, my life doesn't really amount to much. But you see, you change things. Can, can you guys see that one little grain? Oop, I dropped it. It's really tough to get just one grain. There we go. I got another one. You, you see it? There's actually two. There's one stuck on the bottom of my thumb. Now I'm holding up in the light. You want to see either one of them? They're small, so small that they feel insignificant. But let me tell you what, what one little grain of salt can do. It can change the atmosphere. You are the salt 
of the earth. You can not only, by the way you live your life, cause other people to want what you have. How many of us know people today that aren't in church because of church people? Amen. You're making a difference. It just may not be the right difference. But you, you, you are the salt of the earth. You, you ought to make people thirsty for Jesus Christ. I don't know what it is about you, but every day at the office, no matter what they throw at us, you always seem to smile and have pep in your step. Did you ride a different school bus than me? How is it? You, you, you don't know we got problems going to the office? No, my God's good. He's good all the time. You are the salt of the earth. You are that preserving factor. See, salt preserved meat, but it's, it's, it's ultimately it's got to get outside the salt shaker. Let me tell you that. If it sits in there, I mean, this, this looks nice, and that's a, that's a pretty little container even. But if it never gets out of this, it is worthless. You are the salt of the earth, but, but if you won't ever let God use you, see, the only way that salt ends up fulfilling its purpose, it's got to be willing to surrender itself. Not only into the hands of the master, but ultimately you put it in the soup, it melts away. And in the losing of itself, it changes the atmosphere. I believe there are many in church today that we never really see what God can do in us because we want to be seen. I don't mind showing up to church on Sunday, but I still want to have my life when I leave this place. I don't mind coming back on Wednesday. I don't mind showing up at work days and doing all these things. But at the end of the day, I want to have my life. And God says, uh, don't you know, you are the salt. You are the salt of the earth. You are that preserving power. The salt was so valuable because it would preserve the meat. It didn't just change the flavor of the soup, but it preserved the meat. You understand, as a Christian, we, we had that preserving power. I really believe with all of my heart, the only reason that God hadn't already come, the Bible says it's not his desire that any would perish. I believe the reason he hadn't is because there's still enough salt in the earth pleading for lost souls. I believe from the bottom of my heart, the only reason this country is still standing, even though we've kicked God out of our schools, for the most part, we rejected him from our government. This nation, which was built and founded on Christianity, go get your history books. Not the ones that public school will give you, they lie to you. You find out the truth. The reality is this nation was built on Christianity, not plural government. Amen. Not, not plural worship. It's not freedom from God, that, that freedom of religion. It wasn't a freedom from God. It was a freedom to worship Jesus Christ, the one and only God. There's a reason your currency still has that historical comment on it. You know, in God we trust, one nation under God. All of the, this, this nation was built on Christianity, but we rejected them. I believe the only reason that this nation is still standing isn't because we've kept God in it. We've done our best to push God out. But because there's enough salt, there's enough Christians still praying, God, for our country. Don't wipe us off the face of the map, God. Give us grace, Lord. We repent, Lord. I'm praying you'd bring revival. There's enough salt there to still preserve the nation. That's what I believe. We are that preserving factor. That one little grain of salt. Let me, let me break it down a little bit further. That one little insignificant grain of salt. Can I tell you what it truly looks like in the most simplest terms? My mother was a preserving factor in my life. My mother, when I, I, I didn't really have much of a church upbringing, what little bit we were in and out of church wasn't enough really to add up to anything. My father was never in church, so the best of my I don't remember ever seeing him in church. My mother, even when she wasn't in church, I'd see her reading her Bible. She was changing the atmosphere around me. As a little boy, I would hear my mother reading her Bible. Sometimes she would lay on her bed in the middle of the day and be reading her Bible, and I'd be playing, and I'd hear it, and I'd come in and ask her questions. I remember a couple of things that stick out in my mind. One time she was talking about, you know, uh, um, not stealing or something like that in the Bible. I don't remember exactly what verse, but I remember as a little fellow, probably five or six years old, a couple of these memories, and, and I based them off of we, we moved when I was nine. And so I know before we had moved at a young age, I remember one time coming in, my mother had said something about thou shalt not steal or whatever passage she had read. And I was in the living room playing. I went running into there, and I was in tears. Because I thought, you know, 
just like children do, there had been cookies on the counter. Mama said I couldn't have one, but I had taken one. And I couldn't undo it. I done ate it. <laughs> you know, I, I done sinned. There wasn't no, you know, I can ask for forgiveness, but it's done. And I really wasn't, I wasn't, I, I came clean to my mama, not, not because I was afraid of the punishment that she might bring. I, I thought I might go to hell. Listen to her, her little Bible reading, that, that one insignificant day of Bible reading was, was changing the atmosphere in this little boy's heart. Where I wasn't hearing preaching in a church because I wasn't going and my daddy wasn't preaching it to me. He was teaching me about hunting and really how to be a man. My dad was a good man, don't get me wrong. I'd put him up against any of your fathers. My dad was a good dad, but he was not a Christian man. As a little boy, I've always been interested in money. As a little boy, I'd go to the park. We lived across the street from a park in Oak Grove. And I'd walk over to that park, and I'd collect bottles back in the day. And I'd walk, uh, it was about a mile or so, to the Oak Grove Superette. Any of you guys have been around long, you remember the Oak Grove Superette? And I'd walk up there and I'd exchange those bottles for money. And I'd save up my money. I had made up my mind as a little boy, one day I'm going to be rich. And I believe with all my heart that if it weren't for God, I would be. And I don't say that in a negative way. I count that a blessing. I listened to my mama read one day, sitting on her bed. I remember this very vividly. She wasn't reading to me, but she read that passage in the Bible. Matthew says, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. And I heard that, and I come running into the bedroom. I said, Mom, what's that mean? And she explained it to me the best that she knew how, but in my young five- or six-year-old mind, here's what I got out of it. A rich man can't go to heaven. That's not, that's not true. Now I realize it's an, it's an issue of the heart, but I made up my mind that day, listen, if I've got to forfeit heaven to be rich, I don't want to be rich. Now you hear me. She was changing the environment. That one little grain of sand that you can't even see. My mother had a sixth grade education. You were talking about insignificant. If I'd asked her, Mama, you think you can make a difference in this world? Probably not, son. Let me tell you what. Mama made a difference. That preserving factor of the salt, there'd be times, amen. You can give the Lord a praise clap. That preserving factor of salt, I, I tell you, and I, I believe this till the day I die, I'm the product of a praying mama. Even when I wasn't living right and I'd strayed off, you know, and forgotten a lot of the things I heard my mama read in the Bible, but I'd be in parties at places and something come over me. Now I realize the, the conviction of God, the loving conviction of God, seriously, literally sober me up in the middle of being drunk or high, sober me up, something come over me, I've got to leave this place. You see, there was some preserving factor. I, I believe that the reason I didn't die, I was on a, on a fast track to, to, gra to the grave or prison, literally. There's not really a big in-between there. I, I had set my course in a direction I had no business going. And the only reason I believe the grace of God covered me is there was still enough salt at home. Mama was praying, and, and you may think that that little grain of salt is insignificant. You may wonder at times, you know, I don't think, I, Pastor, I've been praying for Junior, and nothing's happening. Oh, but there's the persevering and preserving power of prayer, just like that little grain of salt changes the atmosphere. Still to this day, one of my dear friends in ministry, he's a pastor, but before I knew him as a pastor, his testimony was this. He said, I was a dope dealer. I lived about three hours away from home. I grew up the son of a preacher. If I turned my back on God, I didn't want anything to do with church or God or anybody. I was doing my own thing and making a good living doing it. Looking over my shoulder all the time, he said, but one night the deal went bad. A man pulled a gun on me, pulled the trigger, and it went click. He said, I ran as fast as I could out the door. I got in my car. He said, man, I was shaking the whole way. I didn't know where else to go. I was afraid to go back to my place because I thought this guy was going to come get me. The only place I knew to go that I'd be safe was my mama's house. I drove the three hours. I got home. I forget if he said 1 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning, whatever time it was when he walked into the door. I think it was about 4 o'clock in the morning. That's what it was because she was up at 1. 4 o'clock in the morning, he walks through the door. His mama's up. She said, what's going on? So what do you mean, mama? Everything's all right. She said, no, son. God woke me up at 1 o'clock this morning. I've been praying for you. 
He fell on his knees in his living room that night, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. The only reason I believe he didn't die that day was the preserving power of the salt in the earth. Mama was rolling over out of the bed praying for him. Had no idea. How could she know? I wondered in the back of my mind, maybe Mama knelt down on her knees about the time he pulled the trigger when she said, Dear God, all of a sudden the trigger goes off and the hammer misfires. Gives him just enough time. No weapon formed against you shall prosper is what the Word of God says. That salt, that insignificant salt, let me come back to my mama with the sixth grade education. Here's how the story goes down. She gets a phone call one day and says, Aunt Raynell, I, I, I know you still want more children. There's a little boy in Charleston. She worked at Weston House. There's a little boy in Charleston that needs a home. You want him? My mama quit her job, drove down, picked me up. My dad was a truck driver, gets home a couple days later, sees a little boy in the living room on a blanket, says, who's that? That's your son. Mama, I'm telling you, as small and as insignificant as you may, that you may never know her, you may never see, you won't know, but I'm telling you, she made a difference. And, and it's beyond just that. Listen to me. I'm, I'm preaching this this morning, not because my mama was anything powerful or anything, but she, she was the salt in the earth, and she made a difference in my life, and, and I've most likely made a difference in yours. Most of you in here, I know that God's used me to make a difference in your life, and we can take it back to my mama being faithful to be the salt that God had called her to be. You, you are the salt in the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, then what good is it? Here's what God says. It's good for nothing, not even to be cast down. I know that salt doesn't lose its taste, but in in biblical days, it could. They would go to the seashore and they'd get big rocks of, 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 of salt and minerals, but it wasn't pure salt. And so literally the saltiness could leach or leak out of it. And you'd still have this rock. And you could chop it up and grind it up and put it in, but, but it would lose its flavor. It didn't do anything. And the awful thing about that is, and you guys hopefully understand this about salt, you can take salt and you put it on the ground, it'll kill all the vegetation. Right. Nothing will grow there. The Dead Sea is so, so rich in salt and other minerals, nothing can live there. He says, if you lose that saltiness, he said, what, what's left is that potent stuff still in this rock. It's not even be good to be cast. You'll ruin the ground. Now the translation says this. It it's not even fit for the dung heap. I mean, that's bad when God says, listen, if, if you lose who you are, who I've created you, I created you to be salt. But if you're not, you're, you're not fit to even be cast into the ground, you'll mess the ground up. You're you're not even fit to be cast into a pile of manure. You'll mess the mess up. That's bad. You can't put that in your fertilizer. It won't be any good. what What does it look like to lose your saltiness? You know when you come to church on Sunday and you're on fire for God, but then you go drink with the boys or the girls on Saturday, you've lost your saltiness. Because you mark my words. You, 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 I, I'm not preaching that having a drink is going to send you to hell. That's between you and God. But I can tell you not one good thing's come out of it. Been part of three funerals since the first of this year. Been part of six funerals since. But three of them have been in their 20s involving alcohol. Yeah, I'm a little less tolerant because I see things that you like to pretend don't exist. And I watch mamas crying and I watch husbands crying over their wife and they were partying together and wives and children crying over their daddy laying in a casket and they, nobody intended that to happen. Just having fun. When people need somebody that can touch the throne room of heaven, they'll skip over you. If you don't have the salt, I'm looking for somebody that changes the atmosphere. I may not call you to go party with you, but when I need somebody to pray because my baby's sick or my, my mama's dying, I need somebody that's got the salt. I need somebody that can touch God. 
You, you are the salt of the earth. You are to change the environment. I want you to think for a moment. I, I, I'm going to wrap this thing up. In a, I want you to think, who, who in your life has made an eternal difference in you? You think about some of those people. Who is it that's changed your life? Who is it that made a difference? Here's, here's, let me, I'll give you some of mine. When I think about that, here's what I think about. I think about, I think about one of my school teachers in particular. When I was living this wayward life, and, and I enjoyed getting in trouble in school. I really did. I, I liked getting sent to the principal's office. And, you know, it was one, it's foolishness, but I did. But this teacher, she wouldn't do any of that. Instead, she would, she would short at me, and she'd call me out after class. And she would look up to me, and she would tell me what potential that I had. She couldn't preach to me about Jesus. I don't remember her once ever telling me anything about Jesus. But there was something in this little lady, and, I, and I've told her, to, I'm not one to write letters, but I, I wrote her a couple of letters while I was in the military thanking her because I don't know where my life would be had it not been for the salt that she was in my life. There was something about this little lady that I knew that she loved me and, and I wanted to do better because I wanted to please her. There was something about her that I wanted what she had. I didn't know what that was for years. When I finally got saved, immediately, immediately I knew, I recognized this thing that's now in me. That's what she had. She had Jesus Christ, the love that she was showing. It was just, it was the salt of the earth. She was just being who God created her to be. And it made me want to change. It created a thirst in me. I don't even know what it is that you have, but I want it. It's like going to a restaurant, you know. You got your, eye, your mind on something that you want, and you, you walk in and you see something on somebody else's table. I don't know what that is. I think I want that. You are the salt of the earth. You, if people don't look at you and want what you have, you ought to step back and say, then what is it that I have? I, I, listen, even when I was living a crazy life, I never once looked at the attic and said, I want what they've got. I never once looked at the drunk and said, I want what he has. But I can tell you when I was living that way, I looked at a lot of people who I thought had their stuff together, and I thought, dear God, I want what they have. I don't want where this road's going to take me, even though I didn't know how to get out of it. I, I want what they have. Not their stuff. I want whatever's on the inside of them that gives them peace. Whatever it is that gives them joy and purpose. And I, want, I want that. You are the salt of the earth. I think about not only that teacher, Miss Barbara Roebuck, she's in here in this service. I mentioned her. And what little bit of church I had growing up, here's the sad truth. I was in and out of, of, of churches, you know, quite a few times through the years, never really in church very long. But you know what the honest, sad truth is? I, I was part of a couple of youth groups. As I remember hanging around with the kids, I don't even remember one youth leader. I don't remember the name. I don't remember what they looked like. I don't remember if it was a guy or a girl. They left no mark on my life. Maybe that's my fault. Maybe I don't know. There's only two Sunday school teachers. I don't remember preachers. I remember one. Only because he was so on fire, he'd step on the, the, the walk the pews. Some of you guys have heard that. They'd step on the back of the pews. I'd sit at the back. I thought this joker's crazy, but it's entertaining. <laughs> that's the only reason I remember him. I had two Sunday school teachers that I remember. You might think that you're insignificant. Hey, I'm just holding somebody in a nursery. I'm just teaching a class with only a couple of kids. Miss Barbara Roebuck sitting back here. She was one of those Sunday school teachers that I remember. Miss Barbara made a difference in my life. I doubt very seriously she had any idea that maybe there was a preacher there in the mix somewhere. I certainly didn't. 
Miss Barbara had a little plastic thing filled with candy. And if you remembered your scripture, you come back the next week and you could re recite that scripture. You got a piece of candy. Oh, I was going to get my piece of candy. You're the salt of the earth. She was changing the flavor of my life even as a young man. Your soup doesn't get to reject the salt you put in it. It doesn't get to say, I don't want to be salty. It's too late, Bubba. I already put it in you, and you can't change it. You are the, listen to me. You may feel small and insignificant. You may feel like what you do really doesn't matter, but it does matter. I think about the people who helped build what would become Lexington Church of God. This church was built in the 40s, the one down the road. And I thought about this many times before we moved over here. It grieved my heart. We still own the property. It grieved my heart. We didn't have enough land. It grieved my heart to think the men and women that had invested so much blood, sweat, and tears in building that building. All they were doing was being the salt in the earth, and they were changing the atmosphere. Literally, men, you know, listen, if, if, you, if you work long enough with a hammer, you're going to smack your finger. If you're building anything for any length of time, you're going to shed some blood. So literally, I thought the blood sweat into sacrifice. When, when somebody donated brick, they were being the salt. And somebody else donated pallets, and men beat the pallets apart to to put a roof on the church at the old building, literally. And they mixed concrete by hand, little patches at a time to lay a foundation. And people gave and donated land. I wonder then, just being the salt in the earth, you, you, you feel insignificant. What difference does this little brick make? What difference does this one wheelbarrow full of concrete make? Jean and Bimbo Jones, Bimbo's mama, Granny is what we called her. She lived to be almost 100 years old. But they tell me about this lady who, who would walk down the side of the road collecting cans on the side of the road, take and recycle those so she could donate the money to the church to help build that little church. Just being the salt, you feel insignificant and small. And, you know, what, what difference does, does a bag full of cans, what, what difference can that make? I wonder if they ever saw the thousands of people who would come through. See, listen, just it's not about where we are. It's the number of souls that have come through since the 40s to now. Some of them have gone on to be with the Lord. There are many who are where they are with God today because they were ministered to in this church. Even if they're somewhere else preaching or somewhere else serving, it doesn't make any difference. You, you think you're insignificant because the devil wants you to think that. So I asked you earlier, are you willing? Are you willing to make a difference? Because every day of your life, whether it's collecting cans or holding a baby in the nursery or teaching a kid in Sunday school class and it's just a couple kids, what difference does it make? Ask me what difference it makes. I'm where I am because a woman with a sixth grade education had the love of Jesus Christ in her heart to give a baby a home. Not just any home, but to give him the word. I am where I am today because others in the church, like Miss Barbara Roebuck, was faithful to God to teach a little class to love on kids that just needed a place to go while the grown-ups got preached to. <laughs> we are where we are this morning because men and women put blood, sweat, and the tears into starting something from nothing. You willing to make a difference? Let me tell you how, how much of a difference you can make with what little bit you think you have. It's a true story. This young girl, her name is Jenny Smith. Jenny stood just outside of this little church, crying outside the door. Because there was no room for her. It was too crowded. She stood out there whimpering on the sidewalk just as the pastor walked by. When he saw her, the tears and the way she was pouting, her shabby, unkempt appearance, the pastor guessed the reason. 
He grabbed her by the hand, took her on inside, and found a place for her in that Sunday school class. So when Jenny got home, she went to bed that night thinking and praying to God that the children would have a place to come to church. Well, two years later, little Jenny lay dead in one of the poor tenant houses, tenant buildings. And those parents called for the kind-hearted pastor who had befriended their daughter to handle the final arrangements. As her poor little body was being moved, a worn-out and crumpled little purse was found, which seemed to have been rummaged from some trash dump. Inside of it, they found 57 cents and a little note scribbled in childish handwriting, which read, this is to help build the little church bigger so more children can go to Sunday school. For two years, Jenny Smith had saved for this 57 cent. This was around the turn of the century. When the pastor tearfully read the note, he knew instantly what he would do. The permission from the parents, he kept the little purse and the 57 cents, carried the note and the cracked red pocketbook to the pulpit. He told the story of her unselfish love and devotion. He challenged his deacons to get busy raising enough money so that they could, in her honor, build a larger building. But the story doesn't end there. A newspaper learned of the story and published it. It was read by a realtor who then offered them a piece of land worth many thousands. But when the church sold it, they could not afford it. The realtor offered it for 57 cents. Checks began to come in from far and wide. Within five years, Jenny's gift had increased to over $250,000, a huge sum near the turn of the century. Her unselfish love had paid large dividends. And if you ever visit the city of Philadelphia, look up Temple Baptist Church with a seating capacity of over 3,000 people and Temple University where hundreds and thousands of students are trained. Have a look too at the Good Samaritan Hospital at the Sunday school building which now houses hundreds of Sunday school uh, teachers and many scholars today. So no child will ever be left outside during church again. In one of the rooms of that building, you may see the picture of her sweet little face, that little girl who's 57 cents, made such a mark in history. Alongside of it, the portrait of her kind pastor. These little grains of salt, you are the salt. But pastor, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just me and I, there's not much I can do. If a little girl with a heart for God can take 57 cents and build a hospital, a church that seats over 3,000, a Sunday school and a training facility that's now trained thousands of pastors throughout the years, surely you, yes, little you, can do something if you'll just let God. You, you are the salt of the earth. Stand with me all over the house this morning. Most of you have heard the name D.L. Moody, a tremendous evangelist, powerful anointing. To the best of my knowledge, D.L. Moody was never even ordained or licensed as a preacher. D.L. Moody was a man who had a speech impediment. some other inabilities, but when he really began to believe that he could do something for God even in spite of all the things he had going against him and all the things he didn't have, he began to minister to little kids. And he found a way to, to rent some building. I don't know how or where the funds came from, but this was long before he was the evangelist, D.L. Moody. He was just a man who wanted to do something for God who believed that he was the salt in the earth and it was his responsibility to change the atmosphere where he was, to change the world around him. He rented this, this building and began to teach little kids. And this minister caught wind of it, traveled great distances to see who this Mr. Moody was. He wasn't an evangelist yet. He enters into this building. He sees there a man sitting on the floor. 
with an African-American child in his lap. He doesn't yet realize this is Mr. Moody himself, and he looks at this man who's reading out of the Bible the story of the prodigal son to this little child. But the man could hardly convey the message because he had such difficulty reading. He didn't read very well, could hardly get it out. This was D.L. Moody sitting there struggling to read to a child. Why are you telling me that, Pastor? You'd be amazed at what God can do with your 57 cents and all of your inabilities. This man was faithful to minister to those little children and God continued to bless and anoint him. And God would fill that man and arguably he had one of the most powerful ministries of his era. Pastor still years and years later and as long as the Lord should tarry, I would imagine, will be greatly influenced by the ministry of this one little grain of salt who could hardly read and yet his desire to be the salt right where God had planted him. God said, I can change the flavor of the world around you if you'll just let me have you. And if you're willing to let you be lost in my calling on your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And these altars are open this morning. If you need prayer, I want you to come quickly. All over this house, I'm going to ask you, God, what is it that I can do? I pray this morning, Lord, that our eyes are open, that every one of us become keenly aware that we are making a difference now. The question is, what type of difference? So that we might stand before you this morning and say, God, I desire to make an eternal difference, Lord. My life is not to be spent and wasted chasing after parties, chasing after money, chasing after material things. Lord, I, I want to do something with my life. This short life that you've given me, I want to do something that will matter eternally. Understanding today, God, that I am the salt. I believe today, Lord, that you, the Master God, can place me in whatever you want and truly change the atmosphere if I'll allow you. All over this house this morning, I pray, God, that you would give us a revelation of what we can do today to change the world around us, whether it's holding a child in a nursery or pushing a broom or maybe blessing a, a, a waitress. You go to the restaurant, did you ever think, you know, before you get angry because the service is lacking? With a room full of people there that are probably already irate, you could be salt in that room to that one person. To show love and compassion and grace and mercy. And just being salt in that one situation may be enough to give somebody a thirst to want to know the God that you serve because nobody else in this room was patient and considered to me and thought anything, all they did was complain, become angry. See, that little bit that you can do can go a long ways. All over this house, these altars are open. Come find you a spot and pray, Lord, use me. God's not looking for something big or something grand. You don't have to be mighty or magnificent or extraordinary. The names that I listed to you, the people in my life, they were all just ordinary people. Any of them, had you asked them, would have thought to themselves, I'm certainly not able to really contribute much. Will I make a difference? Probably not much. But they did. You can too. Worship with us this morning as we pray together.
my teaching, my ushering, my giving, Lord. Lord, I pray this morning, God, that as our eyes are open to see that you've called us to make a difference. The salt, you've called us to make a difference in the world around us. And I pray today, Lord, that these, your people, would be faithful, refusing 
to surrender or lose their saltiness, but to be a faithful witness wherever they are, Lord, just to let the love of Jesus Christ, like my teacher in school, let that love shine through us, God. Let that faithful testimony be found in us everywhere that we go, that you would draw men to you. I pray today, Lord, a blessing over these, your people. As we leave this place today, may we go forth in the peace, the power, and the love of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. God bless you.